Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. Why is the prosecutor in the Brian Koberger case being so petty? Why is the Delphi judge so bad? P. Diddy's kids complain about the raid on their dad's house. Actor Jonathan Major loses his bid for a new trial. Young Thug, don't confess in your song lyrics. A mentally ill mom does the unthinkable and our dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. Good day, everyone. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. Thanks for joining us. You know the drill. Subscribe if you haven't. Like if you do. Leave me a comment below, and make sure you hit that little bell for notifications. Hey, and remember, you can listen to us anytime on any of your favorite podcasting apps. All right, let's go ahead and get started as it relates to the DACA today for April 3rd, 2024. First, why is the prosecutor being so petty in the Brian Koberger matter? Well, guess what? I think the news media has finally been watching Crime Talk uh, because if they watched our live last night, you know we talked about this very issue and now it's all over the news today. Yes, the s defense has filed an objection to the court uh, basically stopping any of the surveying work that was being done to prepare empirical data so that the court can see that the trial needs to be moved out of Leta County. And I read to you last night uh, from the uh, memorandum in support of the objection to the state's motion for order prohibiting contact uh, with prospective jurors absent leave of the court. And so the um, defense in this case has uh, filed this memorandum and it says the state has alleged that the defense has violated the court's order and specifically that the state alleges the defense has violated the prohibition on discussing the identity, the nature of the evidence expected to be presented at trial or the sentencing phase of the proceedings. The order also prohibits disclosure of any information a lawyer knows or reasonably know is likely to be inadmissible evidence in trial and that would, if disclosed, create a substantial risk of prejudicing an impartial trial. Now, the defense states that they are aware of all this. After all, the defense wrote the original order upon which it is based, and the state, however, misunderstands the prohibition in this respect. The defense is not disclosing information. The defense is asking prospective jurors in the county of Leta as to what information they are aware of that was previously disclosed vis-a-vis -vis the press. Further, the revised order for non-dissemination allows for counsel to ask questions of the public to do its work. That's exactly what happened. Mr. Koberger is preparing for his change of venue hearing and is mindful of what the court must consider and the available means of obtaining information for the evidentiary hearing. And as it relates to the relevant case law that uh, guides the uh, factors that a court must consider in the motion for change of venue and the state's motion and court order intrudes on one of the ways the defense will seek to establish prejudice pursuant to criminal rule 21. And there they go on and they talk about basically that um, what the court is doing is impermissible. Uh, they should not have said, hey, stop everything that is taking place. And in fact, we have an expert who's going to testify at the hearing, a gentleman by the name of Brian Edelman, and he is going to explain his uh, education. He has a PhD, he has an LLM, which is basically like a master's in tax, and he has a master's degree as well. He's going to provide testimony as it relates to his research experience, his jury research experience, and the numerous years in which he has been doing this type of work. And he is going to explain what the state is objecting to, which is information that's been drawn from the press. Now, like I said, this all started because some Karen gets a call and they think it's some sort of uh, person trying to influence the jury because this person is hearing information that is not part of what they have heard. Doesn't mean it hasn't been in the press, but it means they haven't heard it. So this lady 
calls the prosecutors and said, oh my gosh, somebody's talking about the case. So the prosecutors immediately turn over to their investigators and they find out where this is coming from, a legitimate company, a legitimate researcher who has done not only um, surveys um, as it relates to these types of issues in Idaho on numerous occasions, but across the country for decades. But there's wait, there's more. Then the uh, state finds two other people that say that they're completely shocked that somebody called them. And the defense is basically saying when the prosecution goes on a Friday afternoon after speaking with the defense attorneys and says, yeah, we're doing this because we're required to do it. We're not doing anything illegal. We're not doing anything unethical. The prosecutor on a Friday afternoon, curiously happens to be situated in the same building as the court, um, files a motion, basically ex parte, even though it was filed and they got notice of it. The court grants the order without a hearing. Needless to say, defense is saying, not cool, judge, you can't do that. You know, this is affecting our client's due process rights. You know, he required that under the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution and the applicable section of the Idaho State Constitution. And guess what? You can't go doing that. And judge, you need to rescind that order. So we're going to find out tomorrow at 1.30 if that order is going to be rescinded. It should be. I think the judge jumped the gun, but he probably figured, I don't know what the heck's going on. We need to have a hearing. Prosecution's always right, so let's do that. The prosecutor, he is being petty. He knows this is required. He just doesn't want to take this case out of Latah County and move it to a larger jurisdiction like Ada County, like they did with Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. Why? Because it's expensive. Now, the judge in this particular case, Judge Judge, that's his last name, said he really doesn't want to move this case because it's inconvenient to him. But the reality of it, it doesn't really matter to him. It's to make sure that the due process rights are followed and the defendant gets a fair trial with a fair and impartial jury. The state is entitled to that as well. Now, the prosecutor, when I say he's being petty, he knew this was legitimate. This is petty. And it should the motion to stop this survey should never have been done. This is done all the time in these types of cases, and the prosecutor knows that. And what a good prosecutor should do and always say, Judge, I don't care when you want to try this case, where you want to try this case, but you tell me where and when I will have my witnesses, I will have my evidence, and we will prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt unanimously to a jury of 12 people. But the prosecutor wants to keep it in Latah County. And at the hearing, based upon the affidavit of the researcher, guess what? He's going to say people are, in fact, biased against Mr. Koberger. The court cannot ignore that information. So I think tomorrow afternoon, uh, once the evidence is presented, I think the prosecutor is going to have some egg on his face. And I believe that the court is going to acknowledge that maybe they jumped the gun just a little bit. Anyway, the defense says we were basically done, but we were trying to get information from surrounding counties to see if there was any type of issue um, in those other counties as well. So let's wait and see. But at this point, my opinion is the prosecutor is just being petty. Next on the docket, why is the judge in the Delphi homicide case so bad? Well, Judge Francis C. Gull has denied Delphi murder suspect Richard Allen's request to dismiss the charges because of destroyed recordings of possible suspects that might exonerate Mr. Allen. Now, Mr. Allen's attorneys argued that the destroyed video recordings might contain evidence indicating that someone other than Mr. Allen is in fact the killer. Now, uh, Steve Mullins, the Delphi police chief at the time of the uh, killings, uh, testified during a hearing on March 18th that the recorder mistakenly was left on and recorded and recordings from February 14th through February 20th of 2017 were lost after the drive's large memory was filled. Now, in the order that the uh, court issued yesterday afternoon, the defendant has failed to show that the evidence was exculpatory. Exculpatory meaning that it reduced the 
potential um, uh, guilt uh, as it relates to Mr. Allen, and that it was uh, uh, destroyed negligently, intentionally, or with bad faith. The recordings of the interview between February 14th through February 20th, 2017, were lost due to human error or were spontaneously lost due to the equipment resetting. I know, yes, when you try to argue a destruction of exculpatory evidence issue, you have to show that it was done intentionally. You have to show that there was bad faith. You can't just have negligence. You can't just have incompetence, right? I can tell you, the case that I just tried, it was amazing. The exculpatory interviews just happened to be lost. And then you have a hearing on it. And they say, yeah, we lost a thousand videos that were all recorded and somehow my clumsy fingers, uh, it all just went away. And then you think, well, if they all went away, shouldn't all of the videos in this case be destroyed? Oh, it was just the ones where my client's innocence was being proclaimed and supported by witnesses. Ah, oh, isn't that funny? But once again, the judge says, ah, those, those, those tricky, tricky uh, recording machines, you never know how they're gonna turn out. And you know, there's no bad faith. They just, you know, incompetence, incompetence. And they say, oh, you can just save it for a cross-examination that the cop is a buffoon. Anyway, Mr. Allen's attorneys have suggested in court filings that Libby and Abby, the uh, killers, uh, were part of an Odinist ritual sacrificed and that the two alleged Odinists were interviewed in the days after the girls' bodies were discovered. As uh, the, the judge noted, as neither men were suspects at the time the interviews were conducted, the defendant has failed to show that the lost interview of one of the men was material and that the lack of a recorded interview of the other man was material, as defendant must establish materiality to claim a denial of due process. Mr. Allen has failed to do so in his due process rights have not been violated. Judge Gull, you're the best. As I said, Judge Gull had this hearing back in um, March, and the judge also took up the issue at that same time as it relates to uh, uh, Brad Rossi and Andrew Baldwin, Allen's attorneys, as it relates to the contempt violations that the prosecutor is going forward on because of the alleged violation of the gag order by publishing a news release about the case the day before the order was signed. How can you violate something when the order wasn't in effect yet? But I don't know. The prosecutor's arguing that. And then in the contempt hearing, the uh, prosecutor, Nicholas McClellan, also accused Rozzy and Baldwin of being responsible for leaked photos from the crime scene. Now, we know that this came from somebody that came to the office who used to work for one of the attorneys who was trusted and actually did some work, took the photos on his phone, pictures of the photos on his phone, without uh, the permission of the attorneys and unbeknownst to them, and um, they're going to be held in contempt potentially for uh, not knowing this or preventing this. Uh, you know, you think a trusted employee would do the right thing, I guess, but apparently not. Anyway, Judge Gull has not ruled on the contempt allegations, but I'm sure she will do it at the most inconvenient time for the defense in some way to try and prejudice the defense. Now, Mr. Allen's trial was scheduled to begin on May 13th and run through the end of the month. The jury selection will begin in uh, Fort Wayne, uh, Indiana. And then after the Allen County residents are impaneled as jurors, the trial will then move to Delphi where the evidence will be presented and the jurors will decide Mr. Allen's fate. Now, the uh, court has blocked off three weeks for the uh, trial, including Memorial Day, and the court originally allowed cameras at a hearing, but uh, Judge Francis C. Gull reversed the uh, course and uh, banned media from broadcasting the trial. Now, the uh, news media and uh, several citizens are trying to urge the judge to reconsider her position, and this is why she is so bad. I get it. The defense was going to lose the exculpatory uh, destruction of evidence. I get that. How do you show it was intentional when you have a bunch of bumbling buffoon kind of police officers from a small jurisdiction? They're just incompetent, and you can cross-examine them on that. But given 
the moves of this judge. And I really thought this judge was going to be a good judge. She looked like she was going to be a good judge. She sounded like she was going to be a good judge. And then she went rogue against the defense attorneys in this case. The Indiana Supreme Court has swatted her down. She has been completely dismissive to the defense. In fact, ignoring defense requests and denying defense requests for investigative assistance to the point where the defense had to go out and get go fund me dollars to present a defense. Not good at all. And then the fact that the judge, you would think to make sure that she runs a fair ship, to make sure she's competent, you would think in one of the biggest trials in at least my memory that occurred in the state of Indiana, you'd want to make sure the world could see how things run fairly and smoothly in the great state of Indiana. But instead, Judge Gull wants to deny access to everyone seeing it. But based upon what I've seen thus far, if I was Judge Gull, I wouldn't want anybody watching either. Next on the docket, P. Diddy's kids didn't like the raid. That's right. Footage has emerged showing the uh, raid on uh, P. Diddy's Los Angeles mansion with armed officers pinning his son up against a wall and using armored vehicles surrounding the home. Now, Misa Hilton, the mother of one of the sons, shared the video online uh, this week, about a week after agents stormed the house, as well as the one in Miami amid the allegations of a sex trafficking investigation. Now, she branded the raid as overzealous and over-militarized before claiming it was racist and would not have been so heavily handed if the family were not black. Uh, Ms. Hilton wrote specifically, the overzealous and overmilitarized force used against my son, Justin, and Christian is deplorable. If these were sons of a non-black celebrity, they would not have been handled with the same aggression. The attempt to humiliate and terrorize these innocent young black men is despicable. Enough is enough. Did Justin need several laser beams from firearms pointed at his chest? Did Christian need a gun pointed at the back of his head while he was handcuffed? How many times have you seen unarmed black men not make it out of these types of situations alive? My son's attorney, Jeffrey Lick Lickman, is investigating the excessive use of force, which was unnecessarily and certainly not required by this search warrant. We will fight for justice utilizing every imaginable resource, and I'm not with the propaganda. Now, the uh, rapper's son, Justin, 30, and Christian King Combs, 25, were briefly detained and then released without charges during the raid. Now, yes, I get it. Nobody's happy when their house gets raided. I get it. I wouldn't be either. They trash the place. They come in, huge show of force. They dominate control. That's right, they can do that. And they're operating under a order from the court to go kick in doors, search the residence. Why was it so overkill? Guess what? Allegations of guns and drugs. I hate to say it, mom of kids of P. Diddy. I don't think it was a racial thing. I think it was an allegation of a gun thing, okay? So pump the brakes on it's a racist thing. I don't think it was. I know many, many uh, white people that have had their homes raided uh, with just as much force, if not more. Anyway, uh, yes, the actor, Jonathan Majors, let's talk about him. His motion for a new trial denied. That's right. Uh, Jonathan Majors' request to set aside the guilty verdict in his domestic violence case denied. The motion set forth by the uh, actor's legal team was rejected in New York, opening the doors for sentencing that will take place next week. As you may recall, a jury found him guilty of reckless assault in the third degree and harassment, a misdemeanor, and a violation of a protective order. Now, um, Majors is set uh, for sentencing on April 8th, and he faces up to one year behind bars. Now, the jury originally failed to reach a verdict back on December 14th, but the judge sent them back to deliberate, and four days later, Mr. Majors was found guilty, and a sentencing date was originally set for February 6th. However, that was set out so that uh, the legal team could file this motion for a 
new trial to void the conviction. Don't think he'll go to jail. It's it's a misdemeanor DV case. Got to go do the counseling. Got to go do the classes. Not a probably go to jail case unless the victim wants him to do some jail. He certainly lost his career because of this and um, consequences to one's actions, I would say. Next, Young Thug. We've been bringing you to the trial when it's on, but let me give you some advice. How many times have we said, don't live stream the crime scene, right? Don't put it on video. Well, don't confess in your lyrics either, okay? So the defense attorneys and uh, prosecutors uh, in the Young Thug case, the RICO trial, um, were arguing over a uh, issue uh, over the last uh, day or so, uh, focusing on the degree to which rap lyrics and or audio and video can be used as, as evidence in the trial against old Young Thug. Ultimately, the trial judge declined to disturb the status quo and denied the defense motion. Now, rapper Young Thug, aka Jeffrey Williams, and his defense um, asked the uh, judge to keep in mind a recent Georgia Supreme Court case that uh, overturned a murder conviction in an unrelated case. The high court found that uh, the jurors in this uh, other case of Morgan Cardell Baker, the close friend and road manager of another rapper, were shown a 33-second rap music video that was more prejudicial than probative. The judge sounded skeptical about the motion from the start, noting that the issue in Baker was that there was little nexus between the video and what the prosecutors were trying to prove here. Here, the facts in uh, Mr. Baker's case are a little bit different than the facts in this case, the argued the uh, prosecutor argued, and he distinguished the two cases. Um, I don't believe that the state will show any type of nexus, the defense attorney said, and the states can't proffer to you anything that would associate these lyrics with a certain crime. The closest they came is they told the court that uh, trestle tree, uh, that Jeffrey Williams said the word trestle T, which is a section, a street where crimes were committed, in this case, the fact he is using trestle T is a song certainly cannot be that he is somehow involved in that crime, the attorneys argued. And they continued to argue the state is trying to claim that these lyrics are confessions, but they're just art, his attorney said. And before the judge could uh, actually make up his mind, he, uh, well, he stood up and took a phone call. Anyway, uh, when the judge returned to the bench, he said the defense reliance on the Baker case was misguided and it does not apply to this particular case. It says, it's the court's opinion that the defense relying on Baker is limiting and fact specific. And Baker, although good law, does not apply at this point in time. And therefore he denied both of the uh, motions by the uh, two defendants and he did not change his prior ruling. What does that mean, ladies and gentlemen? Rap music, if it is some nexus to the actual crime, right? If you're rapping, about what you just did. Hey, we're gonna go over and shoot up your house, look out, or we got these guys and they, you know, kind of specifics as to what happens. That's not art, that's a confession, okay? So you can talk in generalities, but when you start getting into specifics, guess what? It's coming in against you. Anything you say can and will be used against you. And it is admissible as a statement bar by a party opponent, ladies and gentlemen therefore not hearsay. Next on the docket, a mentally ill woman does the unimaginable. A woman accused of killing her five-year-old son and putting his body in a suitcase in Southern Indiana has made some bizarre comments to a judge, including a claim that she's under federal surveillance. I mean, who doesn't think they're under federal surveillance these days, right? Anyway, for nearly uh, two years, Dejon Anderson had been on the run accused of killing her five-year-old boy, Cairo Jordan. Now, affidavits show Anderson posted on social media a month before his death saying that she was living with a demonic child. Then on March 15th, the Indiana State Police said Anderson was arrested in Arcadia, California, just outside of Los Angeles, on a murder warrant. Her other charges included neglect of a dependent resulting in death and obstruction of justice. When she appeared in court for the first time 
um, a hearing that uh, was uh, far from tic- typical. Apparently, Miss Anderson gave an alias to the judge, said that she wants to represent herself, and said that a Space Force military detail has been following her everywhere she goes. She said, quote, I've been under NSA surveillance for the past eight months, and how can that qualify me as a fugitive on the run when I've also had a detail from Space Force that was following my every move, she told the judge. Well, the hearing lasted about 15 minutes, but by the end, guess what? The judge was fed up with the antics and said, I'm gonna set your bond at no bond at this particular point in time, and if Space Force comes forward and tells me that they're willing to monitor you, well, we'll take up that issue at a later date for bond. Anyway, the son's body was found on April 16th of 2022 by a mushroom hunter in the woods near New Pekin, Indiana. At that point, no one knew the child's name. By June 1st, with the help of the community, donations, a funeral was held in Salem. And then on October 26th, six months after Cairo was found, police identified him and officially charged Ms. Anderson, his mother, and arrested another woman, Don Coleman of uh, Shreveport. She was sentenced to 30 years in prison with five years suspended to probation. Now, more than a year after that, on November 21st, uh, 2023, Coleman was sentenced to 25 years in prison for her role in Cairo's murder. Court records show Ms. Coleman was with Anderson the night that Cairo was killed, and the probable cause affidavit states that Coleman admitted to walking into the bedroom of the home where she witnessed Anderson lying on top of the child who was face down on the bed with his face into the mattress. Now, Coleman told police it was already done When she walked in, she said Anderson asked her to help put Cairo in a trash bag and then ultimately into a suitcase. Prosecutors said the two women then drove to an area outside of Pekin where they dumped the suitcase in a wooded area. The autopsy determined that Cairo died from vomiting and diarrhea that led to dehydration. And the toxicology report showed no foreign substances in little Cairo's system and he had no significant external injuries. Uh, He was found clean and closed, and there was no indication he was placed in the suitcase alive. Now, investigators said that the boy had died about a week or less before the mushroom hunter discovered the body. And uh, just a quick timeline here. So April 16th, police said the man who was mushroom hunting found the body of the boy in the wooded area, which was about uh, 80 feet off a rural road Uh, in uh, New Peckin, Indiana. On April 17th, police released information in the case and asked for help identifying the child or his parents. And on April 18th, the Indiana State Police announced a dedicated tip line uh, for information. On April 19th, police released that the five-year-old boy's body was found inside a suitcase, hoping someone would recognize the child. The suitcase was in good condition with Las Vegas logos wrapped around it. On April 24th, People living in New Pekin came together for a vigil to show their support, hoping and praying the case would be solved. On May 28th, police said the child died from electrolyte imbalance, most likely due vomiting and diarrhea, leading to dehydration. Police said he was found clean and closed, and there was no indication he was placed in the suitcase alive. Um, The court did note today that uh, he will ask someone from the public defender's office to represent Ms. Anderson, and if she uh, files a written request and uh, they believe she has the ability to comprehend and represent herself, they will reevaluate that decision if she truly wants to represent herself pro se. Uh, she is expected back in court in April and uh, not telling the judge how to do his job, but I think when you start saying you've been followed by the uh, NSA and Space Force, it's time to get that old competency evaluation paperwork rolling. Please go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up for a background subscription service. You'll be happy you did. If there's anyone out there you were ever curious about what was in their background, now is the time to do it. If you're going to get involved with somebody, now is the time to do it. When you go to crimetalksearch.com, you put in the name, literally millions of public records are searched and a report is generated. It's going to give you a report. If they have multiple social media accounts, you're going to find it. If they have multiple phone numbers, multiple email addresses, it's going to be found. And more importantly, you're going to get information regarding criminal history. Hopefully the person you're searching has none whatsoever, but if it's there, it's going to be found. 
you're going to get everything you'd want to know. Whether you're going into business or whether you're going into a personal relationship, you're going to be able to find out the information you want to know. So go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up today. You'll be happy you did. And then finally, our dumb criminal of the day. And I'm starting to worry, ladies and gentlemen, that maybe Colorado is catching up to Florida when it comes to dumb criminals. So here's how it all came about. Hold, hold on tight, ladies and gentlemen. So police searched the home of a Colorado supermarket worker suspected in a series of 20 indecent exposure incidents. What they discovered were some shocking videos showing the man, a registered sex offender, <gasps> shocking, contaminated assorted food products with bodily fluids, including a special order of cupcakes later consumed by children attending a birthday party. Please meet Stefan Masalta. This character is 32 years old and apparently hasn't grown up. Anyway, it's uh, outlined in the affidavit that um, prior to his arrest last month on a dozen of felony and misdemeanor charges, Mr. Masalta is locked up on a $250,000 cash-only bond. Now, the case against Mr. Masalta began from a police investigation into a five-month-long string of lewd episodes outside of a coffee shop in Loveland, Colorado, and Fort Collins, Colorado. The uh, suspect was identified as a male wearing a face mask or some sort of gaiter, and uh, he would appear in the pre-dawn hours outside his shop and then begin pleasuring himself in view of workers inside. At times, the uh, suspect was then also seen recording himself as he exposed and pleasured himself. That's right, there was surveillance video from the uh, scene, and it captured a silver sedan in the area at the time, and the detectives concluded that the car was a 2015 to 2017 Hyundai. A subsequent search of the um, law enforcement and the sex offender database revealed that a 2016 Hyundai Sonata with California plates was associated with, guess what? Mr. Stefan Masalta, who just happened to live in Fort Collins, Colorado, which is about 50 miles north of Denver. Anyway, Masalta is a sex offender. What did he do to get that status? Well, he installed hidden cameras in uh, women's bathrooms in a church, no doubt, in a uh, suburb in California. Now, the California police who arrested Mr. Masalta back in 2015 alleged that he placed a phone inside a tissue box atop a toilet and that the device over a period of several months surreptitiously recorded no less than 14 women and six underage girls. Now, Mr. Masalta pled uh, guilty and uh, the uh, Colorado affidavit states that he uh, pleasured himself to the videos that he made including that while he was still inside the church. After placing the electronic tracker on Mr. Masalta's car, which showed him parking near the Starbucks location in Denver and Lakewood, hello coffee, police executed a search warrant of Mr. Masalta's home on February 20th and seized three phones, two laptops and an iPad and four flash drives. They also found a journal with Masalta's name on it where he discussed his sexual immorality sexual addiction, and his deviant impulses, probably his homework from sex offender treatment. Anyway, the next day, a search of Masalta's uh, car found two more phones, plus printed images of women, some unclosed from angles where it appears that the women may not have known that they were being photographed. <gasps> you mean he did it again? Anyway, some of the phones contained handwritten notes about the women's physical appearance and how the writer wants to have sexual contact with them. Well, the police uh, noted that uh, there were stains on the driver's and uh, passenger seats that were uh, fluorescently uh, scanned over under an alternative light source indicating the presence of some bodily fluids. Masalta's phones, a search of them, revealed a variety of videos as well. One clip that was shot on January 4th showed someone, presumably Masalta, pleasuring himself and touching a this to donuts in what appears to be a grocery store. At the time of the recording, guess what? Mr. Masalta worked as a night stalker at a Safeway supermarket in Fort Collins. Starbucks previously employed him 
as well as 24-hour fitness. The phones, the police allege, also contained evidence pertaining to Masalta's crimes at local coffee shops and videos showing him pleasuring himself and his placing his genitals on food at the grocery store. And it's additionally alleged that products that came into contact with Masalta's uh, seminal fluid and appeared included strawberries in the uh, plastic sale container, donuts, cupcakes, and a large bucket of commercial pastry frosting. Now, a Safeway manager who was shown a, a screenshot uh, told the police that he believed the videos were recorded in the store's bakery and freezer area. In one of the videos, Mr. Masolta touches his penis and pleasures himself on a batch of 12 cupcakes. The baked goods were special Lee ordered items placed with the bakery by a female customer who had requested extra sprinkles on the cupcake. A store employee actually wrote on an order labeled affixed to the cupcake containers, add Super Mario toys if we have. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, you can't make this up, Mr. Masolta. Not only are you our dumb criminal of the day, I don't know, I think you're up there in the uh, probably top 10 perverts of the year. Get some help sir get some help that's all we have for today ladies and gentlemen hope you enjoyed the show thanks for watching we'll see you next time and remember yes the constitution matters